Oh, wow. Thank you. I'll give people a little bit to find their seats. I know we're starting almost on time, which is a shock. I do apologize. Well, warm welcome to Long Meadow this morning. Uh, my name is Caleb. I am one of the members here, uh, and we welcome you to our congregation this morning. The news is pretty bleak. Uh, I, I looked at it this morning. I look at it right before I lead, and sometimes I try and pick out a story. But to be honest, there were so many uh, not great stories out there that I couldn't pick one. And it's very tough to look at the world and remind ourselves that God is actually great and he is in control because we look at the world and it's not very good and it doesn't seem like things are going very well. But one person who had this at the forefront of their mind, despite their tumultuous life and various different scenarios, was David. And one of the Psalms he wrote was Psalm 145. Uh, you can turn to it in your own Bibles if you want. We're just going to look at it a little bit this morning. So Psalm 145 in the NIV version, a psalm of praise of David. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I'll praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another and they tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. I wonder if any of you recognize some of those verses because one of the songs that we've been learning is based on Psalm 145, Great God. And it's good to look at the verses that these songs are based on and remind ourselves of the scripture. So if you're able, can you please stand as we sing our first song?
please remain standing. We're just going to finish a bit of Psalm 145 before we go into our next song. So David goes on and says, They tell of the glory of your kingdom, this is God's people, and speak of your might, so that all people may know your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. So let's sing to the God that reigns over all earthly kingdoms. seated. So Psalm 145, 
God, uh, David talks about how God's people speak of his might so that many may know his mighty acts. And one person that we support in this church is Rona. Uh, recently, she sent out an update, and I'd like to read just an extract of that update for you before we pray for her. So Rona says, I was delighted when Howard, Sophie, and Sandy invited themselves to my home for New Year's Eve. It almost did not happen. Then they appeared with Chinese door couplets for my front door. I felt so honored to have them speak to family as the clocks chimed midnight in China in my home. I even spoke to family in the great city where I used to work. And with Howard's help, I also got to join some dumpling making in one of the halls of residence. I did not feel any relationships developing there, but at the very end, a student named Ruby, who had been organizing the evening, asked for my number to invite me to future events that they have. So that's just a little bit of an insight into what Rowan has been doing. She's reaching out to a lot of the international students in her city. Uh, one of the things that they're doing is they've got two weeks of the Alpha course left coming up. Um, and she's got a friend, Leslie, who has moved closer to the church, uh, and they're coming along. And most importantly, the one that she's very excited about is on the 23rd of March, they have a Highland trip where they go get to see the fluffy cows, as far as I understand. So I'm just going to pray quickly for Rona and all the work that she does. Dear Lord, thank you for Rona and her outreach and her heart to share your splendor and your glory with everyone, regardless of what nationality, regardless of what language they speak. Uh, she loves you, Lord, and she loves sharing you with other people. Pray as she has uh, conversations with the six students who are going on this Highland trip. Uh, it will be a good opportunity for her to share her faith and what she believes in with these people uh, and hopefully will bear fruit in their hearts as you work in them, Lord. Pray also for the various halls of residence as she's been around and other people like Howard, Sophie and Sandy, who she has built up good relationships with. Uh, it's so vital and important that we share our relationship with God and that we bring people in to our personal walk with the Lord. So thank you for all that she does with those people and pray that we will see much fruit of her labours and many more added to your kingdom because of her work. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to stand now and sing of the one who has all the splendor and glory that we should share with all those around us. So if you are able, please stand and sing.
be seated. We're just into March, which means if you're anything like me, the thing that you've tried to give up for Lent has already failed. Uh, and you feel like we're already halfway through the year rather than more like a third. But one of the things we should be keeping at the forefront of our mind is this year's memory verse. So children, pay particular attention because at the end of the service, if you can do the memory verse, I'll give you chocolate. Adults, you just get the satisfaction of doing it correctly. I don't know, something like that. So for a reminder, sorry, that look, uh, that's all right on that screen, you can see it. But it's Lamentations 3, 22 to 24. So we'll say it together. We're just gonna do it three times. Um, so you have three times to memorize it. So all together now, Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, hopefully Ben has told us that if you take away the first word and a lot of the other words, it becomes a lot harder. So we're going to say this again. All together now, Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And then one level harder. Yeah, it wasn't going to be easy this morning. You've got to earn your chocolate, kids. So together, Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. So do try and remember that. I think we're going to try and probably test you every month or so just to keep you guys on your toes. Uh, we're going to sing again a new song that we've been learning about fixing our eyes on Jesus. So if you are able, please stand and sing. Yeah. 
please do be seated. So we're just going to look at a few things in the life of the church. But before I start those, a big thanks to everyone who came yesterday for Martin and Gillian's 60th celebration. It was a great time. Uh, they had a wonderful time. They thank you all for everyone who came and helped out and everyone who attended and the people who ate cake. Although apparently we didn't eat enough cake, so there is cake at the back. Just a reminder that this Tuesday is the church members meeting. Uh, there is a Zoom option available, uh, but please do come to the church if you can. If you are unable to make it, uh, please let Miriam know so that we're aware of who is not there. And this year we're hosting the Easter journey and Russell has told me we're all staffed up. So I don't actually have to do a roll call this time, but it would be great if you guys could keep it in your prayers and in your minds. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to tell children what we believe. Um, they come to the church, they go all around these different stages where people act out different parts of the Easter story. Uh, it's happening on Tuesday the 19th, Wednesday the 20th, and Friday the 22nd of March. So please do keep those in your prayers on those days. Another Easter themed event, we have uh, Easter Family Fun Day, Saturday the 23rd of March, 2 to 4 p.m. If you have any Easter eggs, wrapped individual eggs, egg cartons, or bubble wrap, please speak to Miriam. Is there anything else we need for that, Miriam? Need any helpers? Helpers, we need helpers for that one. So if you are available on that day, uh, please talk to Miriam. The earlier you are to volunteer, the less terrible the job you get given. So it's time now for the kids to go to their groups. Uh, why don't you turn and say good morning to the person next to you? I realized I wiped all of Ben's sermon. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that's got his sermon and that's got communion. Great. Thank you very much. Smooth cover. No one, no one noticed a thing. You guys are sworn to the secrecy now. <laughs> Be great to continue those conversations over bountiful supplies of cake later. Uh, our God is a great God, uh, and one of the things that is so good about him is that he is in control and he has made everything. So just before Ben comes to us to uh, extol from his word, let's stand and sing together, Who Has Held the Oceans in His Hand?
do worship you, Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrate that you will reign forever. And because you are totally invested in us, come what may, we want to listen to your voice now. Show us the depth of your love as we see what you're willing to pay for our liberation. Amen. You take a seat. We're continuing through Mark's Gospel. We're in chapter 14 today, starting at verse 12, which is page 1020, 1020, if you've got one of the Blue Church Bibles. A background theme in this section is freedom. Freedom, something that we all want. We want to be liberated from poverty, from injustice. We want to be set free from stress, from exhaustion. We want freedom from worry, freedom to really live. The question is, how do we get all of that? Most people would seek it in a change of government, perhaps fine-tuning things with democracy, or perhaps overhauling things through revolution. Freedom fighters may use ballot boxes or bullets, but the result is always the same. The new people in power fail to bring freedom. So what about throwing off all authority, just to have anarchy? Well, that kind of freedom brings the worst kind of slavery. Because in anarchy, the darkest instincts that rule each of us are allowed free reign. No restraints is very bad news. So I say I want freedom, but no one on earth, not even me, can truly deliver it. So what about God? Is he interested in bringing freedom? Yes, he is. And it's a freedom to live as we were made to. But the way in which he brings this freedom is absolutely astonishing. His methods will blow your mind because God chose to give the most precious person, his own son, to pay for our freedom. That's going to be the climax of Mark's gospel. And, well, Jesus is already gearing his disciples up for that. The theme of today's passage is all about God's tools of liberation. They are absolutely shocking. We're going to see that it includes duplicity. Christ had to be betrayed to bring us freedom. On top of that, tool number two is death. Christ had to be sacrificed. And before that, Christ also had to face desertion. Christ had to be abandoned. So God's ultimate liberation is not by democracy or revolution. No, it was through Christ facing duplicity, death, and desertion. Such a high price indicates the value that he places on you and me. Well, last week, at the start of Mark 14, we already glimpsed Jesus' mission. Remember, this uh, lady lavishly anointed Jesus with perfume. And Jesus said in verse 8 that it was to prepare him for burial. So his death is very much on the horizon now. Within 24 hours, in fact, Jesus would die on a cross to pay for our sins and set us free. But on the way, uh, we read this at the, at the end of last week's passage, verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, the 12 closest followers of Jesus, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. And they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So a heinous betrayal is already planned. But before it happens, Jesus makes sure that he has a last supper with his disciples, a final opportunity to prepare them for what is ahead. Now, this meal was an annual festival of the Jews, the Passover meal. The meal had to be eaten in Jerusalem, which for Jesus was perilous. The religious leaders wanted him dead, and so he had to be quite sly. He prearranged a dining venue, and as dusk fell, he sent two of his disciples to get the room ready. And then under the cover of darkness, he could sneak into town to enjoy this one last meal with his closest followers. Verse 12. On the first day of the festival of, 
festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Just as an aside, it was very unusual for a man to carry a jar of water in those days. Uh, men would often carry skins of water. It was the women, women that carried the jars. They were a gallant lot, weren't they, the men? Um, so the man then carrying this jar of water is a secret signal. It identifies him out as peculiar in, in the city gates. So it's a secret signal. Without saying a word, they know that this is the man that they've got to follow. He'll lead them to the prearranged dining room. Verse 14. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he'll show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. And when evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. So they're all set to celebrate the Passover feast. A meal of lamb, roast lamb, very nice. Uh, bread, flat bread in fact, and bitter herbs, as well as four cups of diluted wine. And throughout this symbolic meal, they would read various bits of the Old Testament. Year after year, that's what the Jews would do. And they would recount their history. They would sing, they would pray to not only remind one another of their history, but to look forward to an even greater liberation. But, uh, oh, I think, uh, Caleb, can you help me out here? Where is Caleb? Yeah, could you uh, load up the um, PowerPoint slides? Um, so Passover, uh, I've got a little picture up there I wanted to show you of all these different elements. The idea was uh, it would retell the story of their liberation. So the Exodus was all about going out of slavery. Exodus means exit. Uh, if you were to read the chapters 1 to 12 of the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, uh, you will see that in about 1500 BC, God had set his people free from the cruel Egyptians. And the Passover meal included these bitter herbs to remind them of the oppression that they had endured for over 400 years. Cruelty of their Egyptian slave drivers went on and on. And God saw their pain and sent Moses to say, let my people go. Little allusion there to the great film, The Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston. Anyway, uh, I don't know if Moses actually looked like that, but he said, let my people go, commanded by God to bring this message. And again and again, Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to let them go. He only made their suffering worse. And so God sent plague after plague, nine plagues of increasing severity until in the end, God had to send the tenth, a plague of death. The judgment for sin was brought forward that one night. God sent an angel to kill the firstborn son in every house in Egypt. But he told the Hebrews that if they sacrificed a lamb and proved it by painting its blood on the front door frame, then the angel of death would pass over their household. So as each Hebrew household ate their roast lamb together, the wrath of God would pass over them. But it would strike down the Egyptians, and, and so Pharaoh would let all these slaves go. God's people then were liberated from oppression and death. And they had to pack up and leave quickly. Uh, they didn't have time to wait for their bread to rise. They could only make flat bread without yeast. And so the Passover meal included unleavened bread. Well, then God led them, led them through the Red Sea, and he met them at Mount Sinai. Um, and at the foot of this mountain, the people gathered, and God made a covenant, a binding vow to love them as his own people and to bring them ultimately to the promised land. See, freedom means liberation from external oppression, but it also means liberation from self-rule, which is, is always selfish and self-destructive. What we need is liberation to enjoy God's rule. That's true freedom. And so God's people received his law, summed up in the Ten Commandments, as good for them and good for society. 
But right from the outset, it was patently clear that they could not keep God's perfect law. Remember Jesus' summary of it? The summary of the law was to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, not one of us can live that way, and the Israelites knew that very clearly. They would much rather serve self than God. They were at great risk of being punished. The only way to be in fellowship with a holy God would be for a substitute to absorb God's wrath in their place. And so as a symbol of this sacrificial death, they were sprinkled with the blood of animals, and it was called the blood of the covenant. The blood of the covenant marked out God's liberated people as his, pardoned and precious. Well, that's the history that the, uh, was being celebrated at the Passover meal. Uh, now, it seems that some people could celebrate the feast a day early. John 13 begins by saying Jesus' last supper was just before Passover. So how come Mark says in verse 12 that it was on the festival's first day? He also says this was the day when the Passover lambs were sacrificed. Well, it's easy to solve this puzzle. By Jewish reckoning, each day began at dusk. Not like the way we work things out, each day begins at dawn, doesn't it? But for them, each day began at dusk. And so if this is the evening before Passover began, then the following afternoon was when the lambs would die, which, as it turns out, is exactly when Jesus was sacrificed. And that's why I think Jesus chooses to celebrate Passover a day early. But before they share bread, this mark of deep fellowship together, Jesus gives them a shocking revelation. He was about to be double-crossed. Uh, to complete his mission, Jesus had to face duplicity, one of those tools God would bring about for our liberation. Duplicity. Christ had to be betrayed. No other way for the authorities to track Jesus down and arrest him far from the madding crowd. So, verse 18 while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened and one by one they said to him, surely you don't mean me. It is one of the 12, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Well, this is an absolute bombshell. An enemy in our midst? A double agent? Yes, it has to be, because God wrote it in the Old Testament. And God's word always comes true. It was the clear Old Testament pattern already laid down. Psalm 41 verse 9 says, Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. And funnily enough, the close friend sharing bread with Jesus at that meal, the one who will stab Jesus in the back is Judas Iscariot. Mark doesn't here mention his exit into the night. John 13 verse 30 talks about that. But this is the point at which Judas goes to find the authorities to bring them to a private place to address his teacher. All for a measly finder's fee. God knew it would happen. God said it would happen. God decided it must happen this way. It was the only path to redemption. Our liberation hung on this. Well, why have we been told this? Well, I've got three applications for us. Firstly, he loves you. Secondly, he gets you. And thirdly, he's in control. Firstly, <clears throat> he loves you. Whatever life may throw at you, whatever life may take from you, Jesus was willing to be betrayed in order to go to the cross for you. It's just the tip of the iceberg of his agony here. But such as his love, he went through duplicity, through being double-crossed for your sake. A second thing, if you face duplicity yourself, if someone dear has lied to you, if you've been stabbed in the back, well, Jesus gets you. He genuinely understands the depth of pain that you experience. He's been there. A while back, I was badly betrayed by a friend. I was so hurt, bewildered. 
And I wondered where Jesus was in all of it. But then I realized he's never left me. And in fact, he faced betrayal long before me. He gets me. He feels my grief. He weeps with me. Thirdly, Jesus is in control. <laughs> he even subverts evil, all the plans of Judas and the leaders to bring greater good. In God's wisdom, sin can never derail his plans. It can only further his plans. Judas may have chosen money. Jesus had chosen the cross. And in God's wisdom, the cross required this act of duplicity. Isn't it that encouraging when disaster strikes, when you face treachery? No matter how horrible my experience, no matter how stupid I may be, nothing can hinder God's unfolding plan of salvation. Not that that excuses any sin. Judas was tempted by Satan, but he can't blame Satan. He was carried away by the world's ideas of power and wealth, but he can't blame the people who misled him. Judas' betrayal of Jesus is part of God's plan, but he can't blame God. Rather, he would face the punishment he deserved, a fate worse than annihilation. Sadly, it is what all of us would deserve for our many sins. But Jesus came to set us free, and to that end, he had to face the second tool, death. Verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body. Whoa! What is going on, they'd be thinking. Jesus isn't sticking with the usual Passover rubric. This is a radical reinterpretation of redemption. This is no longer about 1,500 years ago, says Jesus. It's about me. I'm going to give myself to redeem you today. This broken bread symbolizes my bodily death. If you want to benefit from that, take and eat. Trust me. Taking and eating is a fundamental way in which faith is expressed. To eat is to say, yes, Jesus, you died for me. I trust you. And in case they missed the point about death, Jesus reinterprets the wine of Passover as well. Verse 23, then he took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Yikes, my blood. Jesus' death has got to happen. And he uses that phrase, blood of the covenant, harks back to Exodus 24, verse 8, that ceremony I mentioned earlier between God and his people when they were sprinkled with the blood of animals. The message was, if sinners like us want a relationship with God, if we want to enjoy his never-ending covenant love, our sin has to be paid for. God can't simply ignore evil and sweep our sins under the carpet. No, the just punishment for sin is death. But God provides a substitute, a sacrifice to die instead of us. Sacrificial blood must be poured out as a demonstration of the death of a substitute. And so the blood of the covenant is the blood of Jesus. His death is what all the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to. The blood of the Passover lamb, which delivers us from death, is the blood of Jesus, God's only son given for us. He's the lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. And his blood is poured out for many. Many. That's a, a reminder, I think, of chapter 10, verse 45. Just flick back there, page 10, 15. Mark 10, verse 45. Jesus said, even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's that wonderful, wonderful word, many. It's not a tiny number that Jesus is going to save, but many, in fact, across the world. This is how Jesus understood his mission. He came to ransom a great multitude, more than we could count, as many as will trust him because his ransom sets us free, free from God's wrath. By his death, we're forgiven all our sins. And now we can enjoy the unbreakable loving commitment, the covenant love of God our Father.
It's infinitely better than choosing to grab some kind of freedom for ourselves. That would be just being left to our own sordid devices. No, much better to be under the rule, the loving rule of our Heavenly Father. That's true freedom. And in fact, it's the freedom to enjoy his kingdom forever. Verse 25, Jesus has a future expectation as he celebrates this last supper. Verse 25, truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Isn't that interesting? The future, according to Jesus, is not ethereal. We're not going to be bored just roaming as spirits up in the clouds. No, there will be drinking and feasting there. That's the eternal life that Jesus offers. Not some vague ghostly future, but a tangible, unspoilt, unending celebration. Jesus paid the price to bring you out of everlasting wrath into everlasting rejoicing. And so our three applications definitely apply. He loves you. He's not just a teacher who cares enough to tell you the truth. He's the saviour who put himself on death row for you. Wonderful. He didn't just face betrayal, but torture and execution on the cross for his beloved bride, the church. So no matter what agonies we may have to endure now, we can never doubt his astonishing love for us. Another thing, he gets you. He understands mortality from the inside. He knows what it is like to see your life ebbing away. As faculties are lost, as pain grips your bones, he understands. Even as you gasp for breath in your dying moments, Jesus is with you with full compassion. Isn't that wonderful? We need not fear death. Jesus has walked that way ahead of us. And as we'll see in a few minutes, beyond. Third thing, he's in control. God knew that his own son would be double-crossed and killed. And yet that most heinous act was for our great good. The greatest good there could ever be. So whatever pain or loss or deprivation or death we may face, we can confidently know God will bring good out of that too. He's that great. He can turn evil upside down and bring greater good out of it. It may be very hard for us to see that now. Terrible tragedies in our lives and across the world. But God truly is in control. And his plan to set his people free is unstoppable. But there's this one more surprising tool that God uses, and that is desertion. See that <clears throat> marked out from verse 26. When they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, oh, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. It was pointless, them trying to argue with Jesus. He knew what God had written in the Old Testament. He quotes Zechariah 13, verse 7. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So the king of God's people, the shepherd, had to be struck down and the sheep had to be scattered. And so... Wind the clock back three years. Jesus had chosen each of his disciples, including the so self-assured Peter, knowing full well that one day, that to a man, they would leave him. They would desert him. They would scatter and deny that they ever knew him. And therefore, I can confidently say, he loves you. He chose you, even though he knew that you would let him down. He knew how wicked and defiled each one of us would be before he called us. 
We may not have known how weak and wayward we would be, but Jesus was under no illusions. We may have met Jesus and pledged our undying loyalty, but Jesus knew how fickle we would be right from the beginning, and he still loves us. Each of us being cowardly like the disciples, we fail to stand out because we don't want to lose face. We fail to stand up because we don't want to lose friends. We're just as unworthy and chicken-livered as those original disciples. Given similar circumstances, we would desert Jesus too. But Jesus knew us before he called us. He knew the depths to which we would repeatedly sink. Isn't it amazing that our shepherd king knew how easily we would wander and scatter and still he calls us back with the same offer, forgiveness and freedom for rebels like you and me. He doesn't just love you though, he gets you. He knows what it is like to be all alone and exposed. He fully understands the agony of of friends who prove false. So whatever the price that you may pay in following him, he's with you and he fully sympathizes. He's able to meet your need precisely to sustain you, whether you're betrayed, deserted or dying. Jesus gets you. And thirdly, he's in control. Jesus knows and chooses everything that's about to happen. He ordains his future and the future of his church. I love this. Uh, You can see the future traced out by the Lord Jesus in so many ways. Verse 18, he says that he must be betrayed. Verse 27, he must be deserted. And even verse 30, he must be disowned. And fulfilling all those symbols of Passover, verses 22 to 24, he knows he must be executed as the Lamb of God. And in verse 8, he's told us already he must be buried. That's why he was anointed with perfume. So centuries in advance, our shepherd knew that he would be struck down and that the sheep would scatter, but not for long. Zechariah also said that there would be a regathering, and although no one seemed to notice, Jesus promised a regathering after his resurrection. He knew that was coming too. Did you see verse 28? This is glorious. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. That's the glorious point at which Mark's gospel will end. The disciples sprint up to Galilee, expecting to see their risen saviour. This is hope for the failures, isn't it? This is new life for the useless. Jesus wants to receive his failed disciples once again. And he will send them out to be his ambassadors. Jesus knows a bit more about the future. Remember verse 9 from last week? Jesus said that the gospel would be preached throughout the world. And that's still happening today. And more than that, in verse 25, he tells us that the kingdom of God will come. And then he will feast. So ahead of time, Jesus knows all that is about to happen. Not just in his own passion, his death, and then resurrection, but the growth of the church, and then glory. Jesus knows it all from beginning to end. He's in control. Before creation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had decided all of these events. So God's control of history is deeply reassuring, isn't it? It means that whatever cowardice we display, whatever desertions we may face, the end of the story is never in doubt. Liberation. Shall we pray? We thank you, Lord Jesus, for such love. We want to turn away from all the rivals in our hearts. We want to love you as you love us. We thank you, Jesus, that you get us. You understand all that we go through. We want to cling to you in every trial and distress. We thank you, Jesus, for such control. You know the end from the beginning. You've decided it all. We want to trust you. We know that we're in safe hands. 
Amen. Well, I've got the opportunity now to remember the act of sacrifice on the cross in the way that Jesus told us to. It's not a last supper, it's the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper retells the story of our liberation. If you're a steward, could I ask you to come to the front so that we can more easily distribute the uh, bread and the juice? For those that don't know, the bread is gluten-free, the juice is alcohol-free, um, so we can all enjoy it. If we trust and follow the Lord Jesus, then you're welcome to eat with us. If you don't yet know Jesus, if he's not yet your saviour, then just allow the bread and juice to go on by. And do think, whatever situation you're in, do think about what Jesus has done. This symbolic meal is an enduring reminder of his sacrifice for many. I didn't share it earlier, but Isaiah 53 talks about many a couple of times. And Isaiah 53, if you know, is that famous passage in the Old Testament, the whole chapter that tells us why Jesus would die for us. It was so that we would be forgiven. And this is the end of the chapter, Isaiah 53. When he, the, the servant of God who dies for us, sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, and he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Well, if you trust him, that applies to you and to me. So as the bread is distributed, do spend some time placing your sins in his hands. He is capable, more than willing, and ultimately sovereign enough to bear your sins and take them away, that you would be counted righteous. No matter how cowardly or despicable you may have been, Jesus <coughs> can set you free. Do think on these things as we distribute the bread and eat it there and then as it comes by. everybody had a piece of bread and wanted it? Good. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you paid for us, bearing our sins away and taking the wrath of God in our place. 
Thank you that as a result, we are counted righteous. Oh, you're wonderful. What a great Savior you are. Amen. Well, I've already mentioned that Jesus' last supper, he was looking forward to drinking new wine in God's kingdom. There's a longing, a looking ahead for all of us as we gather. New wine, new bread, new bodies, new creation, in fact. The word new is very much a theme in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. That's what Jesus was looking forward to. And as we're united with him by faith, we can look forward to it too. So as the juice is distributed, do praise the Lord that whatever is broken or lost in this life will be fully restored and then some. Do hold on to the cups and we'll drink together as one family. Let's proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you've not only set us free from our sins one day, you'll set us free from death and the whole curse that comes with sin. Thank you that one day all things will be made new and we will celebrate with you forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing about this great liberation in one name, the name of Jesus. Let's stand.
Jesus, you are worthy because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God people from every tribe and language and nation. We praise you forever. Amen. Do you take a seat?